So I've been solo traveling through Southeast Asia for the past nine months and decided to do a little Q&A with you guys because there is just so many things that I've had to learn about out here on the fly that I think are super helpful to those who are wanting to travel to Southeast Asia, whether you're wanting to travel by yourself or with a group or whether you're wanting to just go on vacation or travel full time like I do. So if you're wanting answers to all kinds of questions like that, keep on watching and let's get started. So I recently put up a poll on my Instagram story asking you guys what your top questions were about traveling through Southeast Asia. And the top question that I got from you guys was, number I've got it on my computer here, how do you afford travel so much? And do you have an income while you travel? So I'll answer both parts. The first part, how do I afford to travel so much? And the short answer to that is I budget to the max. While I've been in Asia, I've made sure to travel to the countries that are known for being more affordable, such as Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, they all are quite affordable and you can stretch your money very, very far in these countries. I spent about a thousand dollars a month max, including everything, flights, accommodation, food, and some activities as well. So you can stretch your money quite far in some of these Southeast Asian countries. I would love to go to places like Japan and Singapore, but those places are just so much more expensive and just not in my travel budget right now. So for the second part of that question, do I have an income currently while I'm traveling? And the answer is yes. My solo travels kind of started out a little bit differently than a lot of other people's because I moved to Mexico Mexico in order to get my scuba instructor certification so that I could travel the world and make money at the same time. So I spent about a year and a half doing that, moving from place to place following the dive season, but I got to a point feeling like I wasn't actually exploring these countries that I was going to because I was working so much and I had to stay in one location. So I wasn't able to really see the rest of the country that I was at. So and that's when I tried to start getting into this whole digital nomad life. So right now I do make some money from YouTube and affiliate marketing. So I'm just trying really, really hard to expand those sources of income so it can really just fund more of my travels to come. So if you're someone who's wanting to get into the digital nomad life but have no idea where to start, I've actually put a link in the description of my free ebook that I've made. So for anyone who's wanting to get started with uh, affiliate marketing specifically, I've made a free ebook with like all the steps on how to get started. And there's also a link to one of the trainings that I took as well that taught me basically everything. So if you wanna go check it out, it's in the description below. Okay, so now for the next question, which is what place have you been to with the kindest people and I think this one is a tie between the Filipinos and the Thai people. Honestly everyone in Southeast Asia has been amazing but the people in Thailand and the Philippines have kind of just gone above and beyond to help me in certain situations and has just restored my faith in humanity. When I was in Thailand, that's where I spent my birthday. And as soon as the Thais that I work with learned that it was my birthday, they like ran to the supermarket during their lunch break, got cakes and things to celebrate, brought them back. And then the woman across the street who owned her little restaurant made a bunch of Thai snacks and brought them over to celebrate. And it just warmed my heart so, so much. So yeah, I think those two places specifically hold a special place in my heart as the kindest people that I've met so far. All right, now for the next question. How do you ensure your safety while you're traveling and have you had any scary moments while you've been traveling? So nowadays I take my safety very, very seriously. When I first started out, I, was, I didn't really know any better and so I was kind of careless. And because of that, yes, I did actually experience a very scary moment. So I did actually create a full video on my top safety tips for travelers and go more into depth about my scary situation. Uh, I'm going to link it right here if you guys want to check out the full video. I'll give you a little summary of that scary situation. So basically I was just walking home. It wasn't dark yet, but it was kind of getting close to sunset. I was walking along a road where there's not a whole lot of people. And then two guys on their bikes, one came from in front of me, one came from behind and kind of cornered me into a fence and we're just telling me give me your bag give me your bag give me your bag um, but I do have some self-defense tools in my purse at all times I do always carry pepper spray and an alarm with me which are the two things that actually saved me in in that situation the alarm makes like a blaring loud 
alarm sound if you pull this pin. And so I just had them out in my hands and pulled the pin when they came, when they approached me and then that ended up scaring them away. I didn't even have to use the pepper spray, but yeah, then I ran home. So it was that situation alone that really woke me up and scared me a bit being like, okay, I need to take my safety very seriously. So now I don't travel anywhere else without those, but to keep in mind that pepper spray is not legal in some countries. So if you do end up using it in self-defense, they can actually charge you also criminally for using it, even if it is in self-defense. So make sure you look it up before you go places, if it is legal, if you're gonna be carrying it around. Also don't carry it in your carry-on, make sure you put it in a checked bag. And then as far as safety tips, it is kind of just general to everywhere. Like I always share my location with family and friends. I always make sure to keep my bag in front of me where I can see it at all times. Try and avoid walking alone in places where there's not a lot of people around. Kind of just the general safety tips of everywhere really. Okay, so then I'll move on to the next question, which is what has been my route been the entire time I've been traveling? Okay, so number one, I moved to Playa del Carmen in Mexico. That's where I got my scuba instructor certification. So I stayed there for six months. After that, I came back home to Colorado and was exploring some of the national parks nearby. Like I went to Bryce Canyon, Zion National Park, the Grand Tetons and Yellowstone. After that, I moved to an island called Sardinia, which is right off the coast of of Italy, I moved there with my boyfriend at the time. So we were working at a dive shop there. We worked there for three months. After that is when we parted ways. I went to Turkey and I met up with one of my friends from back home. So we spent a couple weeks just touring around Turkey and being tourists for a little while. After that is when I moved to Thailand. So I found a job on the island of Koh Lanta in Thailand and I stayed there for five months working as a scuba instructor as well. After working there is when I decided I needed some more vacation time and I needed to go see more of Southeast Asia. So me and a couple of the friends that I met while working in Thailand went to visit the Philippines. We went to the islands of Bohol, Malapasqua, and Leyte, and we saw a lot of cool things. If you want to check out my videos of the Philippines, I'm going to link them all right here or right here. I don't know what side this is going to pop up on. We stayed for three weeks there, and then Jordi and I went to Indonesia from there. I stayed there for a full month, and again, I have my videos here. I traveled to Ubud and Nusa Penida at this time. After that month, my Indonesian visa expired, so I had to go on a visa run somewhere. So I decided to go to Malaysia and stayed there for a little over a week. After Malaysia, my plan was originally to go to Vietnam. However, I did not apply for my visa in time, so I could not go. So the day I was meant to leave for Vietnam, I had to reroute everything and ended up just going back to Thailand. I went up to Chiang Mai this time and spent two weeks there. After those two weeks in Chiang Mai, I flew back to Indonesia because I was meeting a different friend of mine that came over from the States. And so her and I stayed on Bali for a bit and then went to Gili T. And ever since then, I have been staying on the island of Lombok. I have about three weeks left on my visa right now. So after Indonesia, my plan is to maybe try going to Vietnam again. I'm gonna give it another try, see if it works out this time. So yes, that has been my travel route so far. It's been kind of all over the place. Um, a lot of it I haven't planned until a night before or a couple of days before. It's all been quite spontaneous. Okay, now the next question I love because I love talking about marine life. So what is your favorite place you've gone diving in Southeast Asia? And I think number one is gonna have to be the Philippines. The Philippines just has literally everything you can imagine. I'm super into the big marine life and that's pretty much what you're getting everywhere you go in the Philippines. Second place would be Indonesia, but I do think it is second place mostly because I just haven't done as much diving around here as I maybe would like to because again, the salary of a scuba instructor does not really allow you to go on too many recreational dives without actually working because scuba diving is a very expensive sport. So I would really love to go dive in like Rajampat and just all the amazing places that I know are here, but I just can't do it right now. So from what I personally experienced, I think the Philippines right now is holding number one, but I know for a fact that Indonesia has some of the best diving in the world. So I just can't wait to come back one day and do some liveaboards. Maybe I'll end up working on a liveaboard just so I can do more diving. I don't know, we'll see. Okay, so next question, how do you plan your trips and how do you know where you'll go next? 
So I do a lot of research before I go to a place. I'll look up all kinds of different blogs. I'll look up YouTube videos. And one thing that I have found super helpful about kind of centralizing myself, an area where there's a lot of activities around, is while I'm going through all those blogs and YouTube videos, I'll kind of simultaneously be going back and forth between Google Maps and just pinning and saving all the locations on my Google Maps that I find interesting in that place. Once I'm finished pinning, I then go over to the map and am just able to visualize kind of where everything is that I maybe want to do and then kind of put myself right in the center. And I found that's really helpful for me because you don't want to just book a place that's way far away from all the stuff that you want to do so that every day when you want to do something new, it's like a big long commute and then you get so tired, you waste time. So you kind of just want to be in the center of where all the action is happening. Also another thing, I don't really book any activities prior to going to the new place. I have found time and time and time again that especially in Southeast Asia, you have online prices and you have in-person prices. And the in-person prices are typically so much cheaper than they are online. Take that with a grain of salt because there are some activities that are just so popular and they book up so easily that it is required that you book in advance. Typically if you look up blog posts about a specific activity, there'll be something in there with information on whether to book early or whether to book in person. Travel agencies and especially Thailand and Indonesia I found are so, so good at planning and I've never come into a single issue with using their local travel agency, so I highly recommend. All right, so this next one is the one that kind of piggybacks off of the first question that we talked about, and it's what are ways to afford long-term travel? My top recommendation is going to be slow travel. This has so many benefits. Most places that you book accommodation through will offer monthly discounts. So if you're staying for at least a month at a time, this can really, really save you money in the grand scheme of things. This monthly discount rate also applies to a lot of scooter rentals. Booking for a month, you're gonna get a lot better rate than if you were just to book for a couple of days. And another super good benefit of slow travel is that it really saves you on your mental health because going from place to place to place to place so fast it gets to be extremely tiring you can probably honestly relate because if you go on vacation somewhere you know you you jam pack a lot of activities and you end up going home and you're like oh my gosh i'm i'm more tired now than i was when i went on vacation i need like another vacation just to unwind and that's kind of what you can find yourself getting into if you're going from place to place to place to place especially for me like when I've gone somewhere new, I feel guilty almost for not going out and exploring every single day because I'm like, when am I going to be here next? I don't know. But it's sometimes you just have to listen to yourself and just chill and giving yourself like a month to stay in a place I have found is enough time to let me relax for a couple days, but then also enough time where I can plan out things in advance. Uh, of activities that I know I want to do while I'm here. I do book most of my accommodation through booking.com and through Agoda. Agoda is like Asia's version of booking.com. Sometimes when I'm comparing a place between the two websites, there's like a dollar or two difference per night. So they are quite similar, but you know, I always check the two just to be sure. Now, another tip to save you money while you're actually traveling, which I think is not popular opinion, but anyway, it works for me, is to avoid alcohol. Beer, okay, yeah, that's cheap and you can get away with that, that's fine. But if you're someone like me who likes fruity drinks and cocktails are the only way to go, cocktails are like more expensive than your actual meal. So you're, you're talking about almost doubling the price that you spend on food uh, per month if you just order like one or two drinks at dinner. A little way around this I found is to just order mocktails. The places that I've been do have a very extensive mocktail list actually, like it's a whole dedicated page. And I actually like it first of all because it's about a third of the price of the same drink with alcohol in it. And also I just realized I don't like the taste of alcohol. I like the taste of all the fruity stuff they put in it. So honestly, I think it tastes better and it saves you money. So. There you go. Okay, next question, best food you found in Southeast Asia? I think this is, again, I have a tie and it's going to be between Thailand and Indonesia. Thailand is because their local food is just so freaking good. I just, I can't get enough of it. And it's super cheap. So if you go to the North, you have to try the cow soy dish. 
hands down my favorite Thai dish. Now I say Indonesia and I, I do like their local food here, but in Ubud specifically is kind of what blew me away, most because of their Western food. They have Italian restaurants, uh, Mexican restaurants, Indian restaurants, American restaurants, and then like dessert shops that are, like all the food that they serve is very, very, very comparable to the origin of where that food was created. Like the, the pizza that I found there tasted exactly like the pizza that I had while I was in Italy. The Mexican food tastes exactly like the food that I had in Mexico. Some of the dessert shops were the best desserts I've ever had in my life. And so I don't know how they do it, but it is still something that just blows my mind is how good the Western food is in Ubud. So highly recommend checking that out and making sure you're budgeting extra so that you can try all these places. Okay, now for the next question, if I would recommend a hostel or getting your own private room. Now this is highly dependent on you and your preferences. For the most part, I would always recommend hostels. When I'm staying in a new place and I'm looking to meet people and do things with people, I will 100% be staying in a hostel because it's just so easy to get to know people. The hostels usually put on activities that make uh, like really fun icebreakers for people and you just meet a lot of like-minded people who are up for traveling just like you are. However, now that I'm trying to get into this digital nomad life, I'm having to film quite often and just staying in a hostel or like a shared room, it's very hard to find a private place where I can actually film. And I don't wanna be filming in the room because if there's other people in the room, I don't wanna be bothering them. So more recently, I've been opting for more homestays rather than hostels. I still would recommend homestays as opposed to like big resorts and hostels because it does still give you like that local feeling and a lot of the other people in the homestay areas are still very up to meeting other people and traveling with other people. I've met some great people in the homestays as well. Okay, now next question. What is the best way to get from place to place once you're there? So there are a few different ways to get from place to place. First, I'll talk about uh, flights. So you can fly for the most part very cheaply from country to country once you're in Southeast Asia. I think I usually spend, it's, it's less than $100 for a one-way ticket. Night buses are also a huge thing if you're in more long countries, like if you're traveling from Southern Thailand to Northern Thailand or Southern Vietnam to Northern Vietnam, where the countries themselves are just so long. Instead of buying a flight, a lot of people opt in for the cheaper version, especially like the solo backpackers. They typically opt for the night buses because it's much cheaper um, and also it kind of takes the place of one of your nights of accommodation. So it saves you money there as well. Typically these buses though will go for like 13 hours. So you've got to be very patient night buses always seem like a great idea until you're actually doing it and then it's just it's never been a very very pleasant experience for me so uh, that being said it does save a lot of money so it is an option as far as local transportation within a city that you have a few options i think my favorite way is to be renting a scooter however in some places it can be a little sketchy driving for instance in bali i have never been more scared driving a scooter in anywhere else in asia as i was in bali because there's just so many people there so many tourists driving scooters they don't know the way of the road but in other places like in the philippines and in uh, thailand driving around on scooters is very practical and very safe as long as you do kind of have an idea of their traffic laws and which side of the road they drive on things like that the scooters i think just give me such a sense of freedom i guess to just go wherever whenever i want the other options that you have if you don't want to actually driving yourself there's a lot of tuk-tuks and tricycles depending on what country you're in but they're pretty much the same thing it's just you flag one down on the side of the road they're typically very cheap and it's just for mainly short distances. If you're looking to go long distances, I would recommend getting a bus or a cab. If you're in Bali and don't want to drive a scooter, the cheapest way to get around is by using a company called Gojek. They're basically motorbikes for hire. So you just flag one down and you just hop on the back and they take you wherever you need to go. They do have a couple apps that are very similar to Uber. So I think Gojek is also part of Grab. So Grab is what's similar to uh, Uber, where you can rent uh, cars and cabs and also the Gojek bikes. All right, we've only got a couple questions left. 
Um, the next one, what do you do for cell phone coverage or Wi-Fi when traveling abroad? So I do have a cell phone plan from the US that does allow international data, phone calls, and texting. So the one that I have is T-Mobile. I have like their Magenta plan and that does I'll give you, it gives you five gigabytes of data in every country you go to. Uh, unlimited text, you can make calls, but it does cost money. But I do have an iPhone, so any iPhone users, really texting and calling is irrelevant because you can text and call other iPhone users using just the data. So I highly prioritize data. I would not recommend just going somewhere and expecting to rely on Wi-Fi a lot for safety purposes because I mostly use my data uh, while I'm out and about trying to find maps, trying to figure out where I'm going. And it just really doesn't sit well with me knowing if something happened, I have no way to uh, call my parents or anything like that if I don't have service. So if you check with your phone provider and you do not have any coverage outside of the country, um, I would recommend getting a SIM card. So SIM cards are very easy to find when you go abroad. There's typically plenty of booths in the airport as well offering SIM cards. And basically you just pop out your own SIM card, put the new one in, and then you will load data onto that SIM card and you can keep loading more and more and more on the more you need it. But make sure that you do check with your phone provider to ensure that your phone will accept a new SIM card. A lot of companies have their phones locked so that they won't accept a SIM card. So check with your phone provider, make sure that you can get your phone unlocked and get this taken care of before you leave. Okay, now the last question that I'm going to answer today is the most difficult part of traveling full time. And I would say my answer to this one is saying goodbye to people. Honestly, that's been really, really rough for me, but this has been very, very, very difficult when I was working as a scuba instructor because I got so close with so many of my coworkers and we would spend months together 24 seven. Like we worked so much. Working as a scuba instructor, you work all the time. And so I met so many amazing people and spent so much time with them, formed these amazing relationships. And then all of a sudden, someone's visa expires and they have to leave or someone decides to go somewhere else the the scuba season ends and everyone leaves things like that and it's just that is very very hard for me and i think has been one of the hardest parts of traveling so far there are actually some people who i've met while backpacking where they go off on their direction i go off on mine and then somehow our our paths cross again and a lot of people who i've formed really really strong relationships with i've seen a few of them again or have plans to go see them again so that is nice but it's just hard <laughs> okay so i think that wraps up this q a if you have found this q a helpful for you in planning any of your future travels please give this video a like and subscribe i'm currently in the works of planning itinerary videos for all the places that i've been in southeast asia so far so subscribe to my channel to stick around for those also if you're interested in seeing all of my videos from southeast asia including the philippines indonesia and thailand i've linked all those videos in the description below so go check them out any additional questions that you have for me go ahead and comment them below and that's about it so thank you guys again and i will see you in the next video